the Rover 200 400 diesels. Compact and clean, two new diesel engines to give Rover's medium cars an even greater edge over the opposition. The objective of this programme is to provide an insight to stripping, rebuilding and servicing these new engines. Now, rather than giving you a blow-by-blow -blow account of the procedures, we'll be concentrating on its new features, and particularly where these demand new skills from you. So, if you're unfamiliar with diesel engines, well, watch the Service Insight Diesel Introduction Programme. And don't forget the Rover 825 and MDI diesel engines have already been covered on video. Now this booklet provides a hard copy of the procedures we're about to cover and it's packed full of facts and figures, hints and tips. Don't forget to complete the quiz and fill in the answer sheet. Now before we start work on the engine itself, let's just take a look at how it sits under the bonnet of a new Rover 200. And at the same time, I'll introduce you to some of the basic servicing jobs you'll need to get to grips with during the early life of the engine. Now, this is a, a normally aspirated engine. In other words, it doesn't have a turbo. The most prominent feature is the black plastic air box. It looks as though the air filter should be in there. In fact, it's an extension to the inlet manifold. And these tubes increase the length of the inlet tracts to give excellent torque and low down in the rev range. The air filter is, in fact, beneath this cover. Just pop the spring clips, and there it is. Nothing unusual there. Quite a novel feature is the combined oil filler and dipstick tube. It also houses the oil vapour separator for the engine's closed-circuit breathing system. Incidentally, depression in the breather system is controlled by this diaphragm valve. The oil filter, well that's nice and accessible down here, and coolant circulates around this oil cooler to maintain the engine oil at its optimum temperature. Now there's a very important point to note about the oil filter on this engine. From the factory, cars are supplied with a special fine mesh filter like this with red lettering, which is designed to catch the small particles which circulate around an engine during the running in period. Now this must be changed at the thousand mile service along with the engine oil for one of these service filters with white lettering. If you forget, the fine filter could possibly clog and I don't think it's necessary to dwell on the consequences of that. Moving on, there's uh, three auxiliary belts under bonnet to look after during routine servicing. Of course, wing covers in place before you so much as pick up a spanner. There's a belt for the alternator, for the power steering pump, and for the brake servo exhauster. Now the alternator and the power steering belt tensions are checked by measuring their deflection and full details are given in the booklet. The vacuum pump though has a special adjuster bracket. It's got a square cutout. Now to adjust it, you simply loosen the fixings and then place a dial type torque wrench in the cutout and apply the correct torque. Now with the bracket held at this torque the fixings are tightened and it's as simple as that. Again the booklet covers the operation in more depth. Now the blue unit here is the relay and timer for the glow plugs. Now this performs the same function and works in a similar way to that on the 825 diesel. It controls the length of time in which the glow plugs remain energised. Now to the fuel system. The fuel filter here is a disposable canister type which is changed every 24,000 miles. It's held together 
with this through bolt. Now, don't forget the seals when you replace it. One on either end of the filter and a small O-ring which goes in the filter head. Now, with the new filter in place, you'll need to bleed it to fill it with fuel, in other words. To do this, you'll need to loosen this bleed screw. Attach your bleed tube, a little reservoir. Push the priming plunger until bubble-free diesel appears. And there we've got it. And tighten it up. Incidentally, if you remove any of the piping between the filter and the injection pump, you can bleed the whole system by loosening this banjo coupling. Now, there's another bleed screw at the base of the filter unit. Every 12,000 miles, you need to open the screw and bleed off any water that may have entered the system. The injection pump, well, that's much different in appearance to the Bosch pump used on other Rover diesels. This is the Lucas CAV injection pump. However, it performs exactly the same function. It increases fuel pressure and distributes this fuel to four mechanical injectors in the correct firing order. Now, inside the pump is a complex array of pistons, valves and regulators which ensure the correct amount of fuel is delivered to the engine to suit all speeds and loads. Remember, a diesel injection pump has more to do than just control the volume of fuel delivered. It must also perform the function of an ignition system and control the timing of each injection, advanced for high speeds and retarded for low. You'll probably recognize this as the stop solenoid. It cuts off the supply of fuel to the injectors when the ignition's turned off. This is new, though. This is the stop lever, and it can be used to stop the engine from under the bonnet. Fast idle is controlled by this wax stat in the thermostat housing. Now, when the engine is cold, the wax stat operates an idle lever through this cable and raises engine speed for smooth, cold running. Right, basic tuning adjustments, one of the most important routine servicing jobs. First of all, attach a piece of reflective tape, if you will, Bob, to the crank pulley, and that enables you to measure engine speed with an optical tachometer. Don't try and use the car's rev counter. It's not really accurate enough for tuning. Now, as with any engine, you'll need to warm it up to normal operating temperature, and the cooling fan must have cut in at least once before you start. Now, with the engine running, check for a clearance of between 0.5 and 1 millimeter between the cable nipple and the idle lever. But this injection pump has an anti-stall system which brings the engine speed down slowly when the throttle is released. It's important to set this system before making any adjustments to the idle speed. First, you place a 3mm shim between the throttle lever and its stop screw. A 118-thou tappet shim does the job nicely. Next, push the stop lever far across, far enough to fit a 3mm drill shank in this hole. Now adjust the engine speed through the throttle stop screw. How's that looking, Bob? When you've done that, open the throttle and release it sharply. The engine speed should drop down fairly quickly, but it shouldn't dip below or hang above the normal idle speed. And if you still have problems, you can fine-tune the system by turning the throttle stop screw. Refer to the booklet.
Now, only when you're entirely happy with the performance of the anti-stall system should you proceed with setting the normal idle speed. This is the idle speed screw here, so you need to loosen the lock nut and turn the screw to achieve the correct idle speed. How's that, Bob? There's no fast idle adjustment as such, but you can check the system is working by pushing the idle control lever back against its stop. There, the engine speed should increase to the correct level. Now, before we move on to engine rebuild, let's have a quick look at the turbo power unit, this time in a Rover 418 SLD. Now, although the turbo unit is well over 100 cc smaller than the normally aspirated unit, it develops over 20% more power. Most of this extra power comes from this, the turbocharger. Inside this housing is a turbine and an impeller. Now, this is the turbine. It's spun round by exhaust gas from the engine and it drives the impeller here. Now the impeller acts like a small pump and it forces air up into the engine. Typically it'll blow at around about 13 pounds per square inch. Now one of the drawbacks of turbochargers has been that although they force more air into the engine and hence give a lot more brake horsepower, they also heat up the air as they compress the charge. Now that reduces the density of the air and hence it's less efficient than it might otherwise be. The solution is simple and effective. We cool the air down before it enters the engine. So boosted air from the turbocharger is directed to this intercooler. As it passes through the matrix, the temperature of the air is reduced by some 60 degrees C. And this cooled air is then fed back up to the engine and the inlet manifold. Right, another difference, no oil cooler beneath the filter on turbo engines. To cope with the additional heat from the turbo, an external oil cooler is used, and this is positioned to the right of the radiator underneath the headlamp here. The fuel injection pump on turbo engines is also slightly different. Now, if I pull the hoses out of the way, you can see more clearly. This small unit here fine-tunes the amount of fuel delivered in response to turbo boost pressure. It receives a boost pressure signal through this pipe here. Now beside it is a unit which increases injection advance when the engine is cold. A signal from this micro switch turns the unit off when the engine warms up and injection timing is returned to normal. In essence, though, the basic service adjustments on this turbo engine are the same as the non-turbo unit. Only the actual tuning figures differ. Right, the only thing I haven't mentioned is the timing belt, and there was a reason for that. If the vehicle is used under normal driving, it's not a taxi, for instance, then there's no reason to even look at it during routine servicing, and that's for the life of the engine. So that just about covers the underbody layout and basic servicing procedures of the new Rover 200 and the 400 series diesels. Now let's take a look at how the engines are put together. One important thing to remember about working on new engines, particularly during the post-launch period, is that no major work can be carried out without prior approval from either network services or the service action desk. First of all, the block. Like most diesel engines, the block is of cast iron. Unusually, there's no cylinder liners. The bores are simply machined down into the block itself. Now, reboring is possible, and there's three oversizes of pistons available. The numbering system on this engine is most unusual. Number one cylinder is up by the flywheel, not at the timing belt end as you'd expect. Now it's most important that you remember this revised numbering system because all the repair and maintenance schedules that uh, relate to this unit will use it. Don't be too worried if you get confused. The cylinder numbers are cast into the front face of the block.
long way down there. The turbo engine has oil jets which cool the underside of each piston crown. Now, crankshaft end float is controlled by selective thrust washers at number two main bearing. Those in the block have lugs to prevent rotation. Now, the thrust bearings on turbo engines have additional lugs which mate up with cutouts in the cap. The crankshaft runs in five main bearings and the shells in the cylinder block have oilways cut in them. And don't forget there's a difference between the crankshafts in the turbo and non-turbo units. The non-turbo ones have eight balance weights, those in the turbo engine have only four. And don't forget both crankshafts can be reground. The main bearing caps, well they're pretty conventional, but remember number five cap is at the timing belt end. Plenty of oil on the crankshaft journals when you're rebuilding. Fit all the caps except number one and make sure they're the right way round. And don't forget those thrust washers on number two. OK, well that's a look at the main features of the engine. Let's have a closer look at a rebuild. The sealing of number one main bearing cap is most important. It's a key defence against oil leakage onto the clutch. In the corners of the cap seating, apply two small beads of sealant. Now the cap has two rubber seals and a special tool is used to prevent damage to these seals as the cap's fitted. Fit the seals, oil them and fix the tool onto the cap using the two shortest sump bolts. Coat the plastic shims on the tool with oil and carefully fit the cap, working it in at an angle. When you've torqued the bolts up, remove the tool and use it as a gauge to trim the seals. The crankshaft rear oil seal is drifted in using this special tool. The alloy pistons have a special coating, so be careful not to damage this when decoking. There are two compression rings and an oil scraper ring. The second compression ring is tapered and it must be fitted with the marks facing upwards. The gudgeon pin is fully floating. Again, use plenty of oil and assemble the conrod to the piston with the bearing featherway on the same side as the piston crown recess. Now be careful not to score the piston when you fit the spring clips. Even when replacing used pistons, you must renew the spring clips. To prevent damage to the crankshaft, place rubber tubing over the conrod bolts while you're fitting the pistons. The featherway on the cap must be on the same side as that on the connecting rod.
The oil pump is most unusual. Instead of being driven from the crankshaft nose, it picks up drive through a chain. Now, this is quite easy to fit with the chain over both sprockets, slide the drive gear over the crankshaft. The bolt over the pump outlet is special. It acts as a dowel to locate the pump. The oil pump sprocket is keyed to the crankshaft, and the key is quite a loose fit, so make sure it doesn't drop out. On turbo engines, there's an L-shaped spacer beneath the pump, and the pump also has higher gearing to give additional output for the turbo bearings and the piston oil jets. The seal carrier plate with its gasket can be fitted with the seal in place. Don't forget to lubricate the lip of the seal. The sump gasket must be renewed each time and the two shortest bolts must be fitted over number one main bearing cap. That's the bottom end of the engine, just about complete. Now before we look into cylinder head overhaul, let's see how we go about selecting the correct cylinder head gasket. These head gaskets have two sets of notches. Two notches near the centre identify this as a gasket for a turbocharged engine. The non-turbo gasket has no notches in this position. Both types of gasket are identified for thickness by another set of notches in the corner. Both turbo and normally aspirated engines use an overhead camshaft alloy cylinder head. The cylinder head is fully serviceable head face machining, valve seat resurfacing or replacement and valve guide replacement are all possible. Check the cylinder head for bow in the normal way. The maximum permissible bow is 0.07 millimetres but make sure the camshaft bearing clearances are checked before you consider any expensive machining work. Although resurfaced heads should be marked with an R, it's always a good idea to make a check on the head thickness. Remember, the valve head depth below the cylinder head face is a critical dimension on diesel engines. Always check the valve head stand down after cylinder head resurfacing or whenever the valve seats have been dressed. The camshaft is held in place with three caps. The centre cap controls end float. Now don't forget, this engine is numbered backwards. Lay the camshaft in position with the keyway pointing upwards and apply small beads of RTV to seal the end bearing caps. Before the cylinder head is fitted, the engine must be turned to 90 degrees before top dead centre. That's with number one and four pistons on the way up. Now this is a safeguard against the pistons clashing the valves before the timing belt's fitted. The underside of the head bolt flanges and their threads must be coated with moly disulfide grease. New washers must also be used. There's nothing really unusual about the cylinder head tightening sequence. The now familiar torque plus angle method is used and no further tightening of the head is necessary. A seating torque of 30 newton meters is first applied to every bolt working in sequence. Then a further 70 newton meters is applied to the bolts in the same sequence. Finally, the bolts are turned through 120 degrees. Both camshaft seals are identical. Drift them home using this special tool.
The fuel injection pump can now be fitted loosely on its mountings. The pump drive gear has a built-in puller. When the drive gear nut is loosened, its flange pulls the gear off. Use 18G 1521 to restrain the gear whenever you loosen or tighten the centre nut. Before the belt is fitted, the engine must be set and locked with number four cylinder firing at TDC. A timing pin locates in a hole in the flywheel. Two 8mm bolts are fitted through holes in the pump gear and a single 8mm bolt is fitted through the camshaft timing gear. Now these bolts in the timing gears must only be fitted hand tight. The timing belt has a semi-automatic tensioner. It's similar in operation to that used on the K-series engine. A spring-loaded plunger is used to remove slack from the belt during the tensioning sequence. Turn the tensioner anti-clockwise using a 3 8 drive and nip the bolt up. Don't forget, if you remove a timing belt and intend to reuse it, mark it for rotation and make sure it's refitted the same way. Keeping the belt as tight as possible, work the belt around the idler pulley, the fuel injection pump, camshaft and tensioner pulley, finishing at the water pump pulley. Following this anti-clockwise direction around the driven components pushes all the belt slack towards the tensioner side of the engine. Remove the timing pin from the flywheel and the bolts from both timing gears and then slacken off the tensioner fixings and retighten them. Rotate the engine through two full revolutions, returning to the top dead centre position. Turning the engine like this pushes every bit of slack towards the tensioner. The tensioner fixings are then loosened and finally tightened to the correct torque. And that's it. All being well, you won't have to touch the belt again. The camshaft cover is sealed using a moulded rubber gasket. Apply small beads of RTV along the joints of the end camshaft caps before fitting the cover. Make sure the cover is sitting centrally before tightening the screws. The next job to do is set the fuel injection pump timing. This pump is timed with the crankshaft, pump and camshaft gears locked up in the number four cylinder top dead centre position. Swing the pump away from the engine to its fully retarded position and remove the timing plug. Insert the timing rod into the pump. Now the basis of the timing check on this pump is a measurement of the distance between where the rod sits naturally and its final position when it's pushed right into the pump. And we need to fit a dial gauge for that. The dial gauge is fitted to the pump using the adapter. And during production, these fuel injection pumps are calibrated individually and timing figures can vary from pump to pump. The setting is stamped on this plastic cap and also on a sticker next to the timing hole.
push the rod down into the pump until it bottoms out. Holding the rod in this position, preload the gauge by two millimetres. Clamp it in position and zero the dial. Let the rod rise slowly, counting the number of revolutions as you go. With the pump fully retarded, the dial will stop short of the reading. Make up the difference by moving the pump towards the engine. Remember, when timing diesel injection pumps, the final movement of the pump must always be made towards the engine. Now tighten the pump fixings and recheck the reading. The injectors are sealed to the pre-chambers with a single copper washer. Now this should be fitted with the rounded side upwards. Taking care not to damage the injector pintle, fit the injectors and tighten them to the correct torque. You'll need a long reach 27mm socket. The injector leak-off pipes and high-pressure pipes can now be fitted. Remember, use two spanners when tightening the unions at the pump or you'll damage the delivery valves. The flywheel bolts are patch-locked and they mustn't be reused. This tool is available to centralise the clutch plate while the cover is fitted. The clutch is cable operated with automatic free play adjustment. The right-hand engine mount can now be fitted and the engine's ready to drop into the car. Let's take a quick look at how this is done. First, the engine must be tilted, gearbox down, at quite an acute angle. This is particularly important on ABS cars, where the gearbox must be manoeuvred past the modulator. You'll need some help, and remember, never place your hands beneath a suspended engine. Position the engine as far as possible into the engine bay and fit the left-hand engine mount to the gearbox. Now, raise and tilt the engine until the left mounting can be secured to the body. The engine will now drop quite easily onto the right engine mounting. Make sure all engine mounts are torque tightened to the correct figure. Underneath now, the steering ball joints are split to allow the hub assemblies to swing aside. Now this provides the access for fitting the drive shafts. The right hand drive shaft is unusual and must be removed completely before the engine can be lifted out. It has an intermediate bearing which fits into a housing on the engine block. Fit the drive shaft assembly and secure the intermediate bearing. And then feed the shaft into the drive flange and secure it with a new state nut. You'll need someone to press on the brake pedal. The left-hand drive shaft is a much shorter one-piece assembly, which can be left in the drive flange when the engine's removed. The brake hose bracket must be unscrewed to allow extra movement from the hub. 
a single bolt through the rear engine mount, and that's the engine secured. The rest is pretty straightforward. There's a cooling system bleed in the thermostat housing. Close it when bubble-free coolant starts to flow. Now, when you've finished, warm the engine to normal operating temperature and set that fast idle cable with a 0.5 to 1 millimeter gap at the screw. Set the anti-stall system and the idle speed as before. And don't forget to make a final check on coolant level after the engine's cooled down. Now, before we round the program up, let's take another look at the most important points to remember when servicing and overhauling these new engines. We've seen the special running-in oil filter. Make sure it's changed for one with white lettering at the 1,000-mile service. We covered vacuum pump belt adjustment with the dial torque wrench. Refer to the booklet for instructions on tensioning the alternator and power steering pump belts. The fuel filter, a disposable cartridge and two bleed screws, one for water and one for air. We looked at basic tuning adjustments to the anti-stall system through the throttle lever stop and normal idle through an adjuster on the idle lever. The cylinder block with its bores machined directly into the block casting and remember this engine uses an unusual method of cylinder identification. Number one cylinder is at the flywheel end. And we saw how number one main bearing is sealed to the block. Use the special tool when fitting the cap and cut the seals off using the tool as a gauge. The oil pump is an unusual chain-driven design. The bolt nearest the pump outlet acts as a location dowel and turbo engines have a spacer. Timing belt tensioning is made simple by a semi-automatic tensioner. No checks to the belt are necessary throughout the life of the engine. Fuel injection pump timing is checked using a dial gauge through a timing hole. Don't rotate the engine with the dial gauge fitted. Finally, do make sure you get a chance to read the booklet. It's packed full of useful information. Complete the quiz and send your answer sheets to Correspondence Course Administration. Well, there you are, four new models designed for service. Class-beating fuel economy and Rover refinement. The new Rover 200 and 400 series diesels.